This is Judith Lay saying Moramai, good morning and welcome, as once again the island's Christian community is at your service. Man's Radio. According to Guinness World Records, the Bible is still the best-selling book of all time, with around 5 billion copies sold over the last 50 years, far outselling any other book. But does that mean it's the most read book? Well, quite possibly not. Many of those billions of copies could well just be sitting on shelves gathering dust. Some may have been given as gifts, won as Sunday school prizes, and have seldom, if ever, been opened. In this country, the Bible is readily available, but its value is unrecognised by millions of people. The Bible Society is a charity working hard to change this, because they believe that when people engage with the Bible, when they read it, relate to it, then lives can change for good. Today is Bible Sunday, and at your service today we welcome Liz Babs and Andrew Ollerton. Both of them work with the Bible Society, each in quite different ways, but both of them believe that what lies between the covers of the Bible is exactly what we need to strengthen and guide us through these troubled and often confusing times. And our hymns today all have the Word of God as their theme, starting with this, from the pen of Isaac Watts, and brought to us now by the St. Michael Singers. Lord, I have made thy word my choice. Lord, I have made thy word my choice, a hymn by Isaac Watts. And that's what Andrew Ollerton of the Bible Society has done, as he's got a passion to share his belief that the power of the Bible can change lives. One of the Bible readings set for use in church services today, Bible Sunday, is from the book of Nehemiah, which is found in the Old Testament. It's not a book we often read, so I found a bit of background helped me a lot. When we join the story, God's people, the Jews, have been in exile for 70 years after the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and drove out the Jewish people. But now, 70 years later, they've been allowed to return to their home country. 
but the city of Jerusalem and their temple is in ruins. With a lot of encouragement from a priest called Ezra, the temple is rebuilt and dedicated to the glory of God. But the people of Jerusalem are not doing well, and Nehemiah, who is serving in the court of the king of Persia, is deeply concerned about this and asks if he can leave the court and go to Jerusalem for the specific purpose of rebuilding the city's walls. Walls around a city not only protect the people from enemies, but also unite them as a community within those walls. But it's a huge, demanding and difficult task, and throughout the story, Nehemiah is constantly aware that he couldn't possibly even attempt this in his own strength. He couldn't do anything without the help of God. With this in mind, let's listen to what Andrew Ollerton thinks this part of the Bible says to us today. We have realised through coronavirus that we can't control the world as much as we thought we could, and we need each other more than we realised we did. And I want to bring a message that reflects on how are we going to, as the people of God, process the past and experience spiritual renewal so that we have courage for the future, whatever the new normal may be. Well, I believe that so much of that is about our engagement with God's word, the Bible. This it can be a source of hope and strength and courage as we move forwards. And I want to bring a message out of a particular passage in the book of Nehemiah, which as I've studied it, I've realised how pertinent it is to the context we find ourselves in today. That's why I believe Nehemiah has a great amount to teach us in general. But in particular, I want to focus on an incident that happens in Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, by this time, the great leader Nehemiah has returned from Persia to Jerusalem and has helped mobilise God's people to rebuild the rubble and to restore the city. Let that be an encouragement to us. Whatever challenges we're facing, if God is on our side, the rubble can be raw material and the ruin can become a home again with God's help. So Nehemiah is a great encouragement. The walls are rebuilt. A couple of years ago, we went to Kenya as a family and had a great experience on safari. And one morning in particular, we watched as a, at a watering hole as animals, a whole array of different kinds of animals, made their way to this one source, a source of life. And it was incredible to see the diversity that gathered. I love to think of the Bible like that. It's a divine watering hole and a whole diverse range of people can come and drink when we are thirsty. That's so important to think of the Bible that way. Often we imagine it as a technical book for priests or a scholarly book for academics. But the Bible is not those things. The Bible should not be locked up in the temple. It shouldn't even be locked up in the church. We need to release this in our homes as families. We need to release this in our small groups. We need to release the power of this even in our communities. That's true for us as God's people. We need to centre our lives on the Bible. But it's actually true even for those who wouldn't consider themselves Christians. My wife recently went for drinks with some friends and they were sitting in their garden and after a while, the, it was like the lid lifted, she said, and a couple of people especially just admitted how traumatic the lockdown experience had been for them. And there was a lot of emotion. And in the end, my wife was able to pray for one of the people and then later text a verse of the Bible to them in order to offer this source of wisdom and truth and encouragement to those who would never think of themselves as part of the church. We need to centre our lives on it as God's people and invite a thirsty world to it as well. Secondly, the Bible is a larger story that gives hope. I heard uh, recently speaking to some leaders from across the Middle East and one of them shared uh, very movingly of their work with refugees in the crisis there and he said that on one occasion a shipment of clothing arrived and he laid them out in the warehouse and as an afterthought, he put a few Bibles in Arabic and Farsi there as well. And he said when they opened the warehouse and word got round, there was a stampede, not for the clothes, but for the Bibles. <laughs> I found that so challenging. These poor refugees realised it's the Bible we need. It, when, when the bottom falls out of life, when we feel vulnerable and fragile, this unique book can provide hope because it connects our lives to a larger story that leaves us feeling far less fragile and vulnerable in God's hands. We may feel vulnerable and fragile during the chaos in the middle, but the author, God Almighty, has a purpose and a plan. When we read the Bible, we realise God's got me. <laughs> He's got us. He's not going to fail us. He hasn't failed in the past 
and he won't fail us in the future. We need the Bible to lift us out of some of the immediate challenges we're facing, to give us a fresh perspective and to return us to our lives with new courage to face all the challenges. And then thirdly, the Bible helps us process our experiences, the good, the bad and the ugly. When it's read and when it's understood, it can transform our lives. We need to read it, as Ezra did. We need some help understanding it. But then, after that had happened, when Ezra looked up, he realised the people were in tears. As he'd unpacked the Bible to them, it had begun to help them process the difficult experiences they'd been through, the good, the bad and the ugly, and some emotion began to surface. I think the Bible can do this. It can help us process our emotions. These people, why were they crying? Just the release of pent-up emotion. They'd been through a lot. They'd experienced trauma and loss and pain. And, you know, sometimes we go into coping mode and we just try and carry on. But when an opportunity is given in a safe space, and I've experienced this myself, so often it's the Bible that helps me process the emotions that I need to release to God. Recently, a group of us who were reading the Bible together once a week on Zoom, we were reading Colossians and, and we came across this verse, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And as we read it, one after another, we just began to effectively say how much we longed for that peace, but how much we were struggling to find it. One person had, was bereaved recently, another had lost their job, and many of us were struggling to juggle the pressures of homeschooling and work and everything else, and the stress and and it's sometimes when, you know, there are a few tears because it's sometimes when when a truth from the Bible really hits home that the lid lifts and we we lift out and express our hearts to the Lord in a more honest way. And I don't know about you, but I, you just feel so much closer to other people when you gather around the Bible and vulnerability is the key to authentic community. And we need more of that. I think moving forward, we're going to need a lot more of that. We've got a lot to get off our chest and process and we also need to laugh together and relax. And the Bible became for the Israelites the safe space where they could do all of that and build real community. It helps us process what we've been through in the past and face our fears and challenges for the future with courage together. And I believe that a key part of that, like Israel and Ezra after the exile, as they began to work their way through to a new normal and rebuild their lives, we also need to centre our lives on God's word. We need to rebuild from the ground up and experience the hope and the wisdom and the inspiration that God's word brings. That way we can experience spiritual renewal as the people of God and we can offer hope to a thirsty, needy world in Jesus' name.
summing up Andrew Ollerton's message in song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Like Andrew Ollerton, author Liz Babs believes that the Bible speaks powerfully to our modern world, and she's written much material for the Bible Society that invites us to go deeper into some incidents by actually putting ourselves into the story. Here's David Suchet with some verses from the Gospel of St. Matthew to set the scene. Then Liz invites us to be part of that story. And that's followed by some live worship with Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. In those times when we feel a little bit lost, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Imagine that Jesus is inviting you now to get out of the boat and to walk to him on the water. Are you willing to take the risk? Imagine yourself stepping out onto the water now. How does it feel? What can you see? What can you hear? What are people back in the boat saying? How far away from Jesus are you? What are you saying to Jesus? And what is Jesus saying to you? How far away are you from Jesus now? And when you finally meet with Jesus, what does he say and do?
And what's your response? And how does your encounter with Jesus end? All of us get a little bit lost in life. Sometimes we're lost when we're young, sometimes we're continually lost. But it's easy to lose your way, especially if life lasts a long time. I got a letter from a woman the other day, she handed it to me, it was kind of crumpled, and she said, my mother just passed away, she was in her 90s, and I, I was her caregiver. I'm probably too old to feel this way, but I feel just a little bit lost. And I thought, well, I've known that feeling myself. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto Music from Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. And thank you to Andrew Ollerton and Liz Babs, bringing the Bible to life for our modern world on this Bible Sunday. But some of the Bible can be confusing, even contradictory, and sometimes quite difficult to apply to our everyday life. But help is always at hand. The Bible Society and similar organisations have guides and videos available online, A little bit of searching will produce plenty to choose from. And the staff in our own church's bookshop here in Howard Street in Douglas are very knowledgeable and always happy to offer advice on Bibles that include explanatory notes and other books to help you get the most from reading the Bible. They'd be very pleased to have a chat if you pop in and see them. This time last year, I was busily packing a suitcase and greatly looking forward to going on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. 
how the world has changed since then, and how blessed we were to be able to make that journey. At your service next week, we'll draw together a few of the folk from the island who made that pilgrimage, and they'll be reflecting on their most powerful memories. I think it'll be a really special programme, and I hope you can join us for it. Let's finish now with some news of services and events in the coming days, where you'll be made very welcome. There's a harvest service and afternoon tea this afternoon in Agnes Chapel, starting at half past two. During the service, a collection will be taken that will be split between chapel funds and the work of Médecins Sans Frontières, Healthcare Without Boundaries, and this collection taken at Agnes Harvest this afternoon will support their vital work in the Yemen. Thank you to Keith Watterson for news of harvest celebrations at Abbeylands Chapel today, where there are two services, this afternoon at three o'clock with Reverend Richard Hooten and this evening at half past six with Mrs Marilyn Cannell, and that will be followed by refreshments. Tomorrow evening, Monday the 26th at Abbeylands, there'll be a short service at 7pm, followed by the sale of produce and supper. There's a Festival of Light in Christchurch in Laxey from Monday to Saturday this week. The church will be open each day from noon until 4pm with all kinds of activities. Pop in and join in. You'll be made very welcome. This Wednesday the 28th is Harvest Festival at St Jude's Church on St Jude's Road in the parish of the Northern Plain. The service, which will include your favourite seasonal hymns, starts at 7pm and will be followed by tea, coffee and cakes. The Cool Chapel Hall will be open this week for the annual Fair Trade Sale. It's on Thursday the 29th to Saturday the 31st of October and the Cool Chapel Hall will be open from 10am to 6.30pm each day. There'll be an excellent selection of Christmas cards, foods and crafts, bringing satisfying employment and dignity, fair wages and a better way of life to men and women in some of the world's poorest countries. On these three days, simple lunches will also be served from noon to two o'clock and all proceeds will go to the Methodist charity Developing Orphans, to the Christian Aid Project Burundi Bees and Tradecraft Exchange. This will, as always, be in the most capable hands of Margaret Newton. Looking ahead to next weekend, and you're invited to a Blessing the Plough and Farmer's Celebration service in Selby Methodist Church. That's next Sunday, November the 1st, starting at half past ten. It'll be led by Derek with music by Crosby Silver Band. Enjoy light refreshments and meet the farmers after the service. And next Sunday evening at half past six, the Mariner's Choir will be in Port Erin Methodist Church when the preacher will be the Reverend Richard Hooten. And that's all we've time for today. Do please join me again later if you can, as there'll be more news from the Church's Notice Board tonight on sundown from nine o'clock. As always, my special thanks to you for your company today. If you'd like to choose a hymn for the programme, you can email me anytime on judithlay at manxradio.com and lay is spelled L-E-Y. I'll be back here next Sunday morning, either from 7am as a podcast via our website, manxradio.com, or on your radio at half past nine, when the Christian community of the island will once again be at your service. But right now, this is Judith, thinking of you and those you love and those you're parted from and not able to visit at present. I wish you all a safe and blessed week and a very good morning. The Nation Station Manx Ray